What is going on, everybody? Welcome in to the reveal of the number 23 team in my 2023 NFL Power Rankings, as today we're going to take a deep dive into the Tennessee Titans. This is one I've really been looking forward to because going back to, I don't know, March, I've really disagreed with the overwhelming narrative on this Titans team. I can't tell you how many times I've seen, oh, the Titans are in the Caleb Williams sweepstakes. Oh, this team is going to stink it up, right? Oh, they should trade Ryan Tannehill. They have no chance to compete this year. And I just couldn't disagree with that more. And I get it. This team has lost some pieces. They are transitioning a little bit. But, I mean, all Mike Vrabel has done is won over 20 games the last two years with the most injured team in the NFL over that time. They were heading into a, a competitive Week 18 win and in game last year with Josh Dobbs at quarterback just off the street. Their entire offensive and defensive line decimated into backups and street free agent pickups, and they were still right in the mix last year. So as we'll see with this roster, they still have a lot of pieces here, and there's plenty of reason to believe that this team can win a lot of games. So I am very excited to kind of break down this team, uh, certainly a team that I feel like I'm higher on than consensus, even though they rank 23rd, which isn't something amazing, but going to be a fun one. We also are joined by an amazing guest, James Foster, who is totally dialed into this Titans team. James coming on for the second year in a row, had a great interview with James, so make sure you stick around till the end for that and before we dive in if you could do me a huge favor please take a second to hit that like button down below it really does help me out it tells youtube you enjoy the video to push this video out to other nfl fans just like you and make sure you subscribe if you're not already help me get to 100,000 subs here it's a big goal of mine for this year and you won't miss any of these deep dives as we go but without further ado, let's get started. As we always do, taking a look at this team's offseason moves, their key departures and additions. And uh, really at the top of the list for departures is going to be uh, the offensive coordinator, Todd Downing. And uh, that's going to be an interesting conversation coming up here as they're going to switch to Tim Kelly and perhaps more of a modern spread pro type of scheme. Uh, definitely something to keep an eye on for this team as we've gotten so used to them being that Shanahan style wide zone offense. Uh, but as far as the roster is concerned, Robert Woods in the wide receiver room is going to head to Houston so much. It's almost like a pipeline between Tennessee and Houston with all the moves between those two teams. But Austin Hooper, the tight end is heading to Las Vegas and then some pretty big losses on the offensive line. Nate Davis, Heading to Chicago, Ben Jones was released here. He's still available. I wouldn't be stunned if they bring him back, if the market just isn't there uh, for him. And then if you look further down as well, they're starting left tackle from last year, Dennis Daly, definitely listed in the unconcerning departures because pretty much anything would be an upgrade from what they got from him last year. But he did play pretty much every game as another loss in there is Taylor Lewan, who only played one game for them last year. Their franchise left tackle, uh, pretty much a complete overhaul of this offensive line that's going to be a big focal point of this deep dive. Um, but additional key departures, Demarcus Walker got a sizable contract from the Bears despite only playing 400 snaps for them. He was pretty good for them. Uh, Bud Dupree as well. You'll sense a theme here. A lot of these def like just linemen in general really were beat up, playing half the year, tons of durability concerns. Uh, Bud Dupree kind of at the top of the list there, uh, but they're going to let him go. That was a free agent signing that definitely didn't work out. David Long as well had a bit of a breakout year last year. He heads to the Miami Dolphins, but again, a guy that only got through about 12 games last year. And their veteran kicker, Randy Bullock, is going to leave, adding some questions to the special teams. So to me, those are certainly the more notable losses that will need to be replaced here. Uh, there's another maybe seven players that ate up a good three or 4,000 snaps there listed in the unconcerning departures. Uh, so a lot of turnover and really just a lot of like, I mean, this team ended up playing like 98 players or something ridiculous last year because of all of the injuries. So naturally, you're bringing guys in off the street that you had no future plans for that ate up a lot of snaps that are going to be more unconcerning departures heading into the next season. Um, but they didn't just let guys go. They actually were pretty aggressive in refilling this roster 
And not just that, they made a big play for a potential franchise quarterback, getting Will Levis, which is going to be a really fun conversation, kind of brightening the future, perhaps, of the the upside and long-term sustainability of this Titans team, which has been a question for a long time under Ryan Tannehill. Uh, they also bring in Ty J Spears in the draft, a little bit of uh, shiftiness and juice into the running back room. They get Kyle Phillips back, a wide receiver with a lot of promise that probably never should have gone in the fifth round. Uh, so a lot of hopes for him. They sign Andre Dillard out of Philadelphia. Excited to talk about him. Uh, it was a surprising contract when he came in for the former first round pick for the Eagles uh, at offensive tackle. They spend their first round pick on Peter Skoronsky out of Northwestern on the offensive line. They signed Daniel Brunskill, who's ate up a lot of snaps for the Niners offensive line. Then defensively, they get Harold Landry back. He was kind of the first big, ugly, shefty bomb. Oh, insert star player here has torn his ACL in camp. Uh, that definitely reshaped what they were able to do with their pass rush. So they're excited to get him back, certainly. Uh, they also add Aziz Alshair to that linebacker room to hopefully, you know, uh, make up for the loss of David Long a little bit. Arden Key on the edge, a player who's had a couple of good years in a row now. I think a sneaky good pickup there on the edge. And then Sean Murphy bunting as well at cornerback, continuing to add depth there with some good man coverage players. So I actually like their offseason. Yeah, they had some losses that are going to be a little bit more tough to swallow. But I think a lot of people are really focused on those losses like Nate Davis, Robert Woods, maybe Bud Dupree, David Long, I don't know, and less focused on a really healthy list of additions as well. Some less noteworthy additions they made, they bring in Trayvon Wesco to help out with the blocking. They draft Josh Wiley, another tight end in the fifth round, big body dude, like six foot seven guy, uh, Colton Dowell. Local guy with some freaky athleticism as a late round flyer at wide, uh, wide receiver and Jalen Duncan athletic developmental offensive tackle. And then a pretty healthy amount of like really low level veteran additions as well. The most notable probably being Ben Neiman at linebacker coming over from Arizona who might be in the mix at linebacker uh, and then a bunch of other guys that'll be competing for roster spots. But before we do get into some of those players and the rest of the roster, of course, I want to talk about this coaching staff and how they rank against the rest of the league, as well as what the schemes are going to look like on both sides of the ball. And it's a really important conversation for a variety of reasons here. First of which is Mike Vrabel being here is the number one reason why I'm higher on what this Titans team can accomplish this year. I mean, all Mike Vrabel does is win games. He's very much to me in that Mike Tomlin conversation is like, as far as like, yeah, it's going to be really hard for a Mike Vrabel coach football team to finish under 500. And I know he doesn't quite have the sustained record that Mike Tomlin does, but really as far as the process goes and what the results have looked like since Mike Vrabel got here, that's really how it feels, right? So Vrabel and the Titans are going to rank in that tier one of overall coach and culture, which is the obviously elite tier. And that to me in this series acts as a sort of benefit of the doubt slider. And I think Mike Vrabel has absolutely earned that over the last couple of years. As I mentioned, this team has been completely decimated by injury, yet they've won 19 games over the last two years. He was the NFL's coach of the year in 2021, and it feels like he's in the conversation for that award every single year. He has this outstanding leadership style that really relates to these players. Vrabel is a no-nonsense, hold guys accountable, kind of lead by example type, but he's a guy also that relates to these players. He was in the league as early as 2010, so not that long ago. He kind of understands these players and can relate to these players a lot better than I think a lot of these older defensive minded head coaches. And the proof really is in the pudding with him. So he ranks to me as the seventh overall head coach and again, tier one for overall coach and culture, but also in that first tier of rankings for defensive coaching. It's not just the leadership stuff with Mike Vrabel. He is really applying the Belichick style defense better than pretty much any quote unquote Belichick disciple around the league has been able to accomplish. It is that multiple attacking three, four front where they're going to play man coverage on the back end. They're going to 
plug up gaps and keep that discipline up front while manufacturing stunts and schemes to uh, create unblocked pressure and get after the quarterback. He'll also vary the game plan, going zone heavy one week, man heavy the next, blitz heavy one week, and dropping three the next week. Like he really does adapt to his opponent, the ideal defensive coordinator in my mind. And I really can't emphasize just enough how much I think people might be sleeping on what Mike Vrabel uh, is able to do for this team, even still. Um, he's got Shane Bowen next to him as his defensive coordinator. He's been there since 2021. I, I think he does a good job helping him with the game plan. Um, but Mike Vrabel, make no doubt about it, is overseeing this defense, and that is his group. Now, I, I mentioned this is going to be an interesting conversation, not just because of Mike Vrabel, but because of the offensive coordinator change here, as they're going to move away from Todd Downing and towards Tim Kelly. And I understand a lot of Titans fans have gotten sick of Todd Downing being kind of a vanilla play caller and uh, really just kind of overtaking Arthur Smith's wide zone offense. And it, it, the offense has really been the same here for, what, four years since Ryan Tannehill took over? And a lot of fans are kind of tired of the sort of limits that this scheme, which is very run heavy, very wide zone play action heavy, has put on the upside of the offense, kind of in similar ways to what Ravens fans have complained about uh, to a larger degree with um, the Greg Roman offense. Some of the similar dissatisfaction with Todd Downing's offense. But what I will say is they knew what they wanted to run. They knew how to handpick certain skill sets to run wide zone and play action. And they did that damn well, right? And as we go through this roster, there's going to be a lot of players that I have questions about if getting a little bit outside of a wide zone blocking scheme, a play action heavy passing game is going to get the most out of these guys. Because Tim Kelly comes from the Bill O'Brien scheme which is much more of a modern pro spread style offense where it's a lot more traditional drop back passing game get your typical three step five step drops get through your progressions putting a lot more pressure on the quarterback to make those reads and asking the receivers to be able to run a much more large variety of route concepts and putting a lot more pressure on the offensive line to hold up so in theory, it's a good scheme. We saw Bill O'Brien's offenses with Deshaun Watson be some of the best in the league for a couple of years there. And I think Tim Kelly as a play designer is a, is a smart, younger mind. I don't have any issues with this hiring, but I do have questions as far as how much will it translate in year one on, and to the point where this is actually the largest question mark I have for this Titans team this year is how much does Tim Kelly kind of force his scheme onto this team? And if he does, how does that go? And or how much does he kind of uh, hybridize? Uh, there's probably a much better word to use there, but how much does he make this a hybrid of the Todd Downing Arthur Smith offense that is pretty much all wide zone play action? And how much does he mix that with his style scheme, which is not just drop back passing game stuff but much more head up blocking inside zone gap duo counter that kind of stuff didn't necessarily see a lot of that stuff in tennessee the last four years so it's going to be interesting man they're going to rank in sort of a tier four of kind of fine no issues necessarily with where they're at but i'm kind of one foot in one foot out if you will and it'll be interesting to see where it goes so there's your coaching staff overall uh, obviously a really powerful staff that uh, is going to earn a lot of benefit of the doubt for this team in my opinion and now we're going to get into the roster breakdown here but first things first i want to thank the sponsor of the show underdog fantasy they've sponsored this entire series and will continue to do so throughout the summer they've been awesome to work with but they're also also just the best place to play fantasy football this is my first year doing best ball, and I can't get enough of it, man. The, what's the best part of fantasy football? It's draft day. It's, you know, that looking at your roster after the draft and like, wow, I did the best job ever. Well, with best ball fantasy, 
you can do that right now. You can take out your phone, you can draft now, and then you can do as many leagues as you want because it's draft, set it, and forget it. They will pick the best lineup for you based on your drafted team every single week. There's no waivers, there's no trades. It'll put you in a league with 12 other users. You'll compete against them, and then at the end of it all, you'll be, uh, if you do well, you'll be put into the $15 million prize pool. Yes, you heard that right. $15 million in prizes for Best Ball Mania 4 this year. Uh, you can sign up right now using promo code TFG. And if you do, they will match up to $100 on your first deposit. Uh, that's four free entries into Best Ball Mania 4, your chance at $15 million. You'll support my channel in the process. They also have daily pickums, which are amazing. They also have daily pickums for uh, MLB, of course, the NFL, where you can get up to 20 to 1 payouts. They have season long pickums for NFL right now, where you can really put your NFL knowledge to the test. Underdog just keeps up in their game, man. I know you guys are going to love playing on Underdog, and you can support my channel in the process, signing up at Underdog Fantasy using promo code TFG. But let's get into the roster breakdown, and we're going to start looking at this quarterback room, which is a two-headed conversation as they bring in Will Levis this year. But to me, I think if everything goes according to plan here, Will Levis won't see the field in year one, and I think that's totally fine. You know, Ryan Tannehill, ever since he got to Tennessee, has shown us he is the definition of a good system quarterback. You put the tools around him, specifically for Ryan Tannehill, in a play-action heavy system, and he can execute at a top 14 to 15 quarterback level. Now, last year, the system fell apart. Pass protection, the weaponry, simply put, were not there. Wasn't great to begin with, and then the injuries made things far worse. And what we saw from Ryan Tannehill was, of course, he's not this amazing improviser. He's not someone that can truly you know, drop back 30 times a game and consistently get to his second and third reads and avoid mistakes. What I think we really saw from him was he started to kind of predetermine his reads a little bit to the point where he was like, this is going to have to be there or I'm going to get sacked and this is going to be a disaster. And we saw some pretty ugly interceptions being forced late last, uh, late last season. The grades went down for Ryan Tannehill. Of course, the efficiency went down and the perception of who Ryan Tannehill is went down to the point that I think a lot of people were saying this team should ship him off for a third round pick. And the Titans were like, no, he's our starting quarterback. We still view him as someone in that tier of Kirk Cousins, Dak Prescott, maybe Derek Carr. Uh, he's going to rank over Derek Carr, who we just, you know, broke down for the Saints, who had, I think, even a worse, a worse year than Ryan Tannehill had last year. But to me, I still think Ryan Tannehill can play. There was plenty of signs that when the structure was in place, he can still make those throws. Now, we already mentioned the scheme change, but Ryan Tannehill is going to be the first of a long list of conversations about scheme fits with a potential scheme change. And to me, he is the starting point for why you don't want to get completely off of the wide zone stuff. And I think if Tim Kelly's smart, he's going to do a little bit of mixing and matching because when Ryan Tannehill is at his best, it is via play action where he can snap his head around and attack the middle of the field with precision, timing, and accuracy, honestly, with the best of him. He is beautiful in those situations when everything is set up well. It's how you got him in like 2019, 2020. He was like the, one of the highest graded quarterbacks, if not the highest graded quarterbacks per PFF because he was so efficient with that structure around him. So to me, it's going to be inter interesting to see what the scheme looks like. Because if they do go to more of that spread style stuff, that's when you're looking at more of like what Ryan Tannehill was with with Adam Gase. This is a, kind of a similar scheme in a lot of ways, and it definitely wasn't as pretty, right? So going to be interesting to see. I know I keep saying that, but the scheme is such an important aspect of everything. But with a quarterback like Ryan Tannehill, who is so system dependent, I think you need to cater to that a little bit. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, and then they draft Will Levis. And I was obviously very high on this draft pick because I had a true first round grade on Will Levis. And I had him as high as in a second tier of quarterbacks in this draft with CJ Stroud and with um, Anthony Richardson. 
And it's so fascinating that these three guys are now competing in the AFC South. And I think you look at Levis with the rocket arm, the size, pretty good athleticism. And there's obvious conversations to be had about upside there, right? Like you can kind of picture a world where he's Matthew Stafford with his physical tools. He also has that quick flick of the wrist release that you love to see from these quarterbacks. But I also think there's a lot more floor there with Will Levis than we, we we tend to talk about with him. Like, I really did think he read defenses significantly better than he got credit for. It's just he was like Ryan Tannehill last year in the NFL. It was almost like, you know, going back to watch Ryan Tannehill prepping for this series. It was like watching Will Levis in his final years at Kentucky where the receivers stink. They're not getting open. They're not. Um, catching balls when they're thrown their way but beyond that the pass protection was even worse than that and that's what we saw with Ryan Tannehill last year surprise surprise his play fell off same thing with Will Levis at the college level where 2021 he had a pretty good structure around him and he was really good 2022 the structure falls off he's pressing not a lot of opportunities to make big plays and there just wasn't an opportunity for him to put up stats and produce but i still see a guy that ran a pro style offense that understands how to read defenses that can get through his progressions i see some accuracy issues being the first of his concerns and i see pocket presence being something that's going to be a potential limiting factor on him where he just doesn't really navigate or sense pressure all that well at all and Honestly, I think that reduces his ceiling more than people discuss with Will Levis. You know, I saw him as more of a higher floor, uh, I don't want to say lower ceiling, but limited ceiling type. I, I think the highest, like best case scenario for him is Matthew Stafford. I think a worst case scenario is something like a Ryan Tannehill. And I love the fact that he has a year to develop here. They have a clean transition where hopefully they can clean up some of the questions about the offensive line and the weaponry clean up kind of what this scheme is is gonna look like moving forward with tim kelly and then really let things roll into 2024 with a clean slate for will levis and i'm not saying you're throwing ryan Tannehill to the wolves you're going to compete with ryan Tannehill, but i do think it's pretty clear that this is the last year uh in tennessee for Tannehill. so the room as a whole is going to rank 18th and that's all ryan Tannehill really where he stands at this point in time for me um and then we, we should talk about Malik Willis, even though it feels like if he plays again, it's not going to be in Tennessee. I think he is going to be the third string here. I think Will Levis will be the second string. And it, it was just a matter of understanding the scheme and being able to play in the structure of this offense. It was just uh, really not there. Like, for lack of a better terms, he couldn't run the offense. And they eventually pick up Josh Dobbs off the street who was better at running the playbook than Malik Willis, who had had all year to, to learn the offense. And it was obviously concerning. He's going to be, I think, 25 by season's end. And being able to read out a, an offense and, and attack the middle of the field, that was a huge question for him coming out of Liberty. And uh, I hope, you know, year two comes and he can figure things out because the physical tools are off the charts. But they took a third-round flyer on him, and very clearly they are – treating it as house money at this point. And uh, I think the most likely scenario is he sticks around for the majority of his rookie contract here, eventually ends up available, whether it's he's on the practice squad or they just release him. And maybe he can carve out a career as a nice backup. Maybe he's playing in the XFL in a couple years. I, I don't know. Um, it just really was a worst case scenario for a boomer bust prospect in year one. Uh, and we'll, we'll see where it goes. But I want to transition now to the weaponry here, which is definitely a pessimistic outlook for this season. They currently rank 32nd in the league. Now, we do have to have a brief conversation about DeAndre Hopkins, who is in the mix to sign in Tennessee. You know, the series must go on. But if, if Hopkins signs here, I actually like this group a lot more. I think you do have a nice group of complementary skill sets if you put in that number one wide receiver. We know Hopkins can thrive in Tim Kelly's offense. And this would probably jump up off the top of my head to be like maybe 19th or so in terms of weaponry. 
And the Titans would probably rank like in the teens for me as far as overall team ranking. I'd be much more optimistic about this team's ability to be in the playoff mix if they sign DeAndre Hopkins. So I do want to get that out of the way just because it's it's definitely something that could be coming down the pipeline. Uh, and I want that to be included here. But as it sits here today, this is the worst group of weapons in the entire NFL. I think they were last year and they didn't really do much to improve it, right? If anything, it got worse. They let Robert Woods go. But it did get better because you have Traylon Burks now hopefully fully healthy heading into year two and you get Kyle Phillips back. So I think there's a little bit more uh, depth and diversity of skill sets there, which is extremely important. Um, right now, Traylon Burks is set to be this team's clear cut number one wide receiver. And as far as fantasy football is concerned, and as far as Traylon Burks individually having a great year, I think it's set up very well for Burks. I love his skill set where he is big, strong, fast, a ball winner, uh, quicker than you would expect for a guy his size. I would say like as far as what his ceiling is and what his play style is, he's kind of a mix of Debo Samuel and AJ Brown. And obviously that AJ Brown style is why they essentially traded AJ Brown for Traylon Burks. Now that was a huge mistake. They would take that back in a heartbeat. That's why they fired their GM. Uh, but you know, there's still a world where Traylon Burks can turn into a really dominant wide receiver for them. And I, I think there's a good chance that this year can be a really good step towards that as long as he can stay healthy. The one fascinating thing is scheme, right? You look at those two players, A.J. Brown and Debo Samuel especially, a lot of their success has come on attacking the middle of the field on crossing routes, drags, slants, digs, really building up that long speed where they're set up as well with really great run after catch opportunities. And I don't know if Tim Kelly's kind of pro spread offense is necessarily the best fit for Traylon Burks. They're going to put a lot more emphasis on his route running and ability to win on the sidelines, more in that DeAndre Hopkins mold than in sort of that Debo Samuel mold. So a big reason I loved Traylon Burks was if he could go to a system fit, a Shanahan scheme, I thought his upside was immense. I don't know if he can be a separator type and a consistent perimeter ball winner type. That's not how he was used at Arkansas and not how he was used in his first year in Tennessee, where he had a lot of success. Now, it's not to say he didn't have vertical wins, though. So there are examples of him being able to do that. And as we saw with A.J. Brown himself, he went to a scheme much more like this in Philadelphia, and he had the best year of his career. So definitely not saying Traylon Burks can't do it. It's just going to be interesting to see. How does he translate to a different scheme? How do they acclimate the scheme to him? Maybe it's the best of both worlds and they do a little bit of both. It's just wait and see in that department. But love the player, love the opportunity. Don't know if I love the surrounding situation being set up the best for his success, but I still think overall the arrow is pointing up. And certainly if you want to talk about underdog fantasy, a player that he rolls around, what, like round seven, round eight? Uh, I think that's, you know, I'm targeting Traylon Burks because the upside for him is fantastic for him to really be the focal point of this passing game. And he's he could have some huge weeks as well because of his explosiveness. But the question marks continue after that. You got Nick Westbrook-Akine, who talk about scheme fit being a question, man. I love Nick Westbrook-Akine in a Shanahan-style scheme. In fact, we've already talked about him like four times throughout this series because we've talked about other players in Shanahan-style schemes looking at what Nick Westbrook-Akine does as a big slot, as a blocker, as a guy that can get lost on crossing routes and corner routes off of play action uh, as a dominant scheme fit. Well, what does that look like if they're asking him to just line up outside and win with Kyle Phillips playing in the slot in 11 personnel? Um I think it's very fair to raise question marks because Westbrook Akine is not some great athlete with vertical speed or some great route runner. I do think he's a good ball winner, but if you're lining guys outside to just play X wide receiver, is he any better than Chris Moore? I think it's fair to raise questions about that, right? So again, how much does Tim Kelly look at what they've done schematically and continue to do that? going to be a major question mark because if they just go full Tim Kelly offense, 
I think Westbrook Akina is, is just a guy. The wide receiver five type. Uh, Kyle Phillips is the next guy here that I think is a, a big swing for this passing game. Love Kyle Phillips. That was a complete steal in the fifth round. Screamed like Jarvis Landry, um, you know, um, Hunter Renfro. Guy that falls in the draft because he's not a vertical receiver, but you plug him in the slot and he can be a top 10 slot receiver in the NFL. I really think Kyle Phillips can be that as early as this year. I mean, this is a guy that would theoretically benefit from a scheme change. Now, you know, he played 70 snaps last year in four games. He just could not stay healthy and he's got to stay out there. But if you want to talk about getting into a lot more 11 personnel where you have that true slot where he's going to be the first or second read for Ryan Tannehill. And it's like, okay, did he get leverage on that uh, linebacker against zone coverage? Did he beat the slot corner on a corner route or a, a, a slant or a whip route or a dig, a hitch route? You know, he's really a great route runner, a great separator. And if he can stay healthy, I think his arrow could be pointing up very quickly and could be one of the surprise breakouts, not just for this team, but around the league. But a year two guy who was a fifth round pick who played in four games last year. So we just haven't seen it. You can't rank him all that high. I'm optimistic that he can be successful, uh, but we have got to see him put it to the field. And then you really don't have a lot of depth beyond that. I mentioned Chris Moore, who's a wide receiver, five type, had a decent year for the Texans last year. I think he can come in in place of injury and catch the football, and that's about it. Uh, they have Racy McMath, who's a deep threat, who's very slowly developing here. Still sticking around, though. I didn't think he was a draftable prospect, and, uh, you know, it's been a it's been a long slow path for him um and then they take colton dowell in the seventh round I, I do love this pick for what it is uh freak athlete out of tennessee martin six foot four like north of 200 pounds insane athletic testing scores and he did produce at tennessee tennessee martin at over a thousand yards in his last year so i love the dart throw a local guy i can only imagine grew up a titans fan so he's gonna definitely compete and the physical tools are there. So definitely someone to keep an eye on. If there's some camp hype, definitely wouldn't be surprised. Reminds me a lot of, for those that remember Jeff Janis for the Green Bay Packers, who was a seventh round dart throw on athleticism. And there was some opportunity there. Um, you know, people are going to be intrigued to see what Colton Dowell can do. You have some interesting undrafted types as well. Reggie Robertson out of SMU in year two. You know, he's got tools. I think as a prospect, he's better than what Colton Dowell or Racy McMath were. So if he makes the team, he has potential to be like a low-end starter. I think he also had a lot of uh, injury questions at SMU, so he's got to stay healthy. You got Mason Kinsey as well. If Kyle Phillips can't stay healthy, if he's like hurt in August, maybe Kinsey can uh, compete for a roster spot, maybe even slot work. Um, but you also have Jacob Copeland, who I think is just a more athletic, um, better player for that role. He's a good route runner with some speed out of Maryland. So, you know, they got some options. Kyrus Jackson as well played his role uh, as kind of a rotational guy and a good blocker at Georgia. So there's worse rooms of like undrafted type groups competing for roster spots. And there's going to be opportunities here. So I wouldn't be surprised if any of these guys really made the roster or even made um, you know, showed up in the back box score basically this year. But then as we get to the tight ends, Chigo Conquo, man, I'm such a diehard Chigo Conquo fan. I might have to get a jersey if he has a breakout year here, which I think is is certainly in the cards. So, you know, when he gets drafted, I, I loved Chig as a prospect. I, I pumped him up. Um, you know, I, I said he was the love child of John of uh of Kyle Yuschik and John U. Smith, which is pretty high praise and a big reason i said that however was wanted to see him go to a shanahan style scheme and when he went to the titans i was like hell yes they are gonna get him going uh on crossing routes leaks use that speed to scheme him open and man they did that now he did more than that he ran routes and one on corner routes and uh uh, one up the seam, which shows that he doesn't have to play in that scheme, which is why I still have 
an up arrow next to his name on this graphic and still think he can have a breakout year. But that scheme fit is still going to be something to monitor. I don't want to keep dwelling on it, but they really did have a group of weapons here that was built to run wide zone and they might not be a wide zone offense anymore. So, um, you know, while I think Chig's skill set coming out of Maryland kind of had to go to a wide zone scheme, I don't think he's limited to having to run that throughout his career. Like, I think he's shown he can run route, run, run routes. He can win contested balls. I think he's he's yacked up. He can be a really good blocker. He can continue to develop in that department. He's certainly willing and a good blocker on like leads and split zone, which they can do in a uh, more pro spread style system. So there's still going to be ways to use him. And I think maybe the way you need to reshape this is think of him a little bit more like maybe Delaney Walker, um, where he was more of a traditional inline pro style tight end so i'm very interested to see the the balance there how much does the scheme cater to not just chigo conquo's skill set but everybody's skill set as we keep talking about and doing the wide zone stuff and letting him use what he's best at which is just pulling away from linebackers on play action but also how much does chig continue to adapt and evolve into a pro style type of spread type of scheme where he is going to have to run more traditional routes and be more of a traditional tight end love the skill set think he can be a top seven tight end at some point in his career does that happen this year probably not but i wouldn't say it's impossible uh, so i'm a big fan of chigaconquo I-, I would say i'm most optimistic for him out of this group i like Traylon brooks a lot i like kyle phillips a lot but um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of question marks across the board, but I feel pretty good about what they're getting from Chigo Conquo. The only question mark is going to be the the marriage of scheme and, and skill set there. They bring in Trayvon Wesco, blocking type, not going to evolve as a receiver at this point in his career. And then they draft Josh Wiley, who is more traditional Y tight end as far as physical profile goes, six foot seven, like 250 pounds. I was lower on Josh Wiley. A lot of people were surprised he didn't crack my top 10 tight end rankings video. I I don't hate him as a player. I I like that he's fast at six foot seven, but that's really all you have there. Didn't see route running. I thought he was an incredibly stiff athlete. Uh, And just the ability to consistently win balls, the ability to be a blocker in line. There's a lot of development to come there. So I'd be surprised if they get a lot from him in year one. You got Kevin Rader, who made the team last year, played like four or five games as a, you know, kind of quasi starter. He'll probably make it again just because Wiley, I think, is a bit of a project. I think Raider's probably your tight end three. Elise Mack, definitely um, a, a thick, strong tight end that still has some potential out of Notre Dame, potential in the way that he could be like a tight end two type. So, there's some names there, but to me, if you're getting a good tight end in this group, it's it's Chigo Quanquo. And then as far as the backs are concerned, um, I list both Derrick Henry and Tajay Spears because I think it's going to be pretty much a split, at least in the first half of the season. You know, Derrick Henry can catch screens. They let him get lost on those play action uh, the like fake wide zone and then fake play action and then come back to him the other way where it's basically a double outside zone in a lot of ways Um, but you know he can catch the ball and turn up field but he is not a route runner and he will drop the ball so you want to get the ball in his hands he's a really difficult player to tackle in space but it's not necessarily easy to get the ball in his hands other than like check downs and screens and I would probably just reiterate those points with Hassan Haskins and Julius Chestnut who are just bigger backs Um, but you know Tyje Spears is definitely in the mold of that receiving back someone that can be a difference maker in the receiving game call that aaron jones austin eckler ty j spears really has that upside as a player he showed it at tulane where he was really good in the receiving game he showed it in mobile where he was uncoverable out of the backfield so he brings an element to this game that uh to this team that i'm not going to say they haven't had you know, they've had guys like Hilliard who can do a little bit of this stuff, but Spears takes that to the next level. And once this team puts full faith in him as a rookie third down back, which 
when it comes to pass protection and um, being in the right place at the right time, like some staffs just have a little bit. Um, some staffs can have more, some can have less like leniency with that kind of stuff. But I do think we see him out there eventually as the true third down back, maybe by year's end. He really showed the full package, route running, hands, ability to make guys miss. The only question is going to be pass protection, I think, but I think he can do it with the right coaching. And the other question is going to be injury. You do have to kind of bring that up. Came out really after the draft, a guy that, you know, we did know he has torn his ACL twice, but questions about like degenerative knee issues. I think it's more of a question of like long-term sustainability for him, more like Jay Ajayi stuff than it is like, is he going to get hurt again? We know he's explosive and he's explosive right now. So I, I like Ty J Spears quite a bit in the receiving game, especially. And I think as the year goes on, he, he could be an impact for this group of weapons. You also got Jonathan Ward. He's the guy that made that like ridiculous one-handed catch on a, on a punt fake for the Arizona Cardinals a year or two ago. Teams haven't really leaned on him in the receiving game, but when they have, he's shown that he can make a couple plays. So like maybe there's something there. But to recap this group, like I like a lot of these guys' skill sets. I think there's certainly upside here. Like, can I see by next year, Traylon Burks, Kyle Phillips, Chigo Conquo, Ty J Spears, like this is a pretty nice group of guys for this offense to work with? Absolutely, I can. But coming into the year, this group is entirely unproven. It's certainly one of the thinnest, if not the thinnest group of weapons in the league. You have guys like Burks and Phillips and Ty J Spears, for that matter, with potential injury question marks. So this group is just going to have to come out, get the job done, and, and prove this 32nd ranking wrong. But at this point in time, I really don't think it's all that close Uh, for who should rank as the worst group of weapons in the league. And I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that ranking either. But now we get to have a little bit of a lighter conversation as we get to the running back ranking, where they are still second in the NFL, where Derrick Henry is right at the top, man. I think him and Nick Chubb, it's kind of pick your poison. I am going to give Nick Chubb just an ever so slight nod, as we'll see. Both are going to have 95 grades on the graphic there. It's got to be somebody, number one. But, you know, Derrick Henry just continues to go, man. It looked maybe to start last year like things were slowing down a touch. Had a measly 25 yards on 13 attempts at Buffalo week two. But really from that point on, he was back to being mostly good old Derrick Henry. Not quite as many breakaway runs as like 2019, 2020 when he was definitely king henry getting 2000 yards each year but he still to me has that similar effect on the game where he feels like the more carries you give him the more the more likely the more likely you are to win the game and i hate when people say that like the zeke elliott stat where the cowboys are like you know whatever 20 and 0 or whatever when they give him 20 carries or more that bs like derrick henry's the one running back where i think it actually is visibly noticeable that he has a wearing effect on the defense and it's only a matter of time before he breaks free for a big chunk game-changing run it's his combination of vision where he sees cutback lanes knows when to press it to the corner he's got rare light feet to kind of you know he's not shifty he can't really juke you all that well but he He's kind of slippery for a big guy, maybe is the way to describe it. When he changes lanes, he kind of catches linebackers off guards, uh, off guard, and it, it allows him to kind of slip through. Now, it's the threat of his power that allows that to happen, I think, because guys have to go low to tackle him. So as long as he stays strong in his feet and he keeps running his feet, he is going to run through a lot of arm tackles on his lower half. Sometimes he'll go down a little bit uh, easier than you'd expect. He can get a little bit top heavy in that way. Uh, but that's a, a trade-off you will happily take with Derrick Henry, who I still expect to get 250 plus carries, to have well over a thousand yards, to have that wearing effect on opposing defenses, whether he's running outside zone or not. Now that is another player here that I think it's fascinating to monitor. Because when I think of Derrick Henry and when he's at his best, it is in this wide zone offense where they're giving him those, you know, 
15 plus times a game. They're giving them a stretch run and stretch runs by nature do have more potential for those breakaway opportunities. So does Tim Kelly want to do that 15 times a game with Derrick Henry? We'll see. Inversely, can Derrick Henry apply his skill set to inside zone, to power, to any variety of runs that are going to be different here? And I don't know. I think he's certainly at his best on outside zone, but I think his vision and his power can still apply to running, you know, traditional pin and pull uh, behind the guard. Like, I think he can do that. I think he can read out inside zone. I think he can definitely run counter. So it's, it's, I hate to just say it's going to be interesting to see, but for the film nerds out there, you have a quarterback that is Shanahan scheme oriented. You have a couple receivers, tight end that's Shanahan oriented. You have a running back that's Shanahan style oriented, and you have a spread style scheme coming in, or at least a pro style, pro spread, modern, whatever you want to call it, a non Shanahan scheme coming in. Um, all of this balancing is going to be so fascinating to monitor. Uh, but I'm still expecting a very good year from Derrick Henry. He's one of the few backs that because of his size, he just doesn't seem to take those horrible hits that lead to him getting injured a whole lot. And he's been a little bit more banged up lately than in his prime, but I'm just not that worried about huge regression or injuries with him in the way that I am with some other backs. Uh, so again, ranking second is a huge, uh, putting a lot of weight on Derrick Henry, who I do expect to get the majority of the workload here. But I do think they will sprinkle in Ty J Spears, especially on third down. So if they want to, you know, run a draw to set up third and uh, fourth and manageable, for example, or, um, you know, just run out of shotgun a little bit more. I think Ty J Spears is going to be very effective for those types of runs. I his running style, his upside, all of it just reminds me a lot of Aaron Jones. Um, he is shifty. He has very good vision. I think that upside is in play for him. I don't know if the long-term durability stuff is going to pop up and be an issue, but I just, I really like this pick. I think it was a great value where they got him. Spears was my third overall running back in this class, just a touch over Zach Charbonnet. Obviously a different style of back there with Charbonnet being more of a bruiser, but I see star potential in Tajay Spears. I really hope that the knee stuff is just, you know, reports and we don't really know, and he can have a nice long healthy career because he is explosive as hell when he's out there uh you got hassan haskins still uh, now he was third round uh, third round running back that i thought was overdrafted a little bit i just didn't necessarily see the upside in his game decent power wasn't overly efficient when he got out there last year i think as an rb3 though and a goal line back that's a good spot for him you also have julius chestnut who we put the eye emojis next to his name last year just because of his name i had never watched him play um, but he actually got some camp buzz last year, got on the field a little bit, made some plays. So we're all pulling for Julius Chestnut uh, to maybe overtake Hassan Haskins and maybe eventually be a uh, short yardage compliment to Ty J Spears would probably be the best case scenario there. He's a little bit of a bigger back. Uh, Jonathan Ward, probably just more of a special teamer, potential third down back. Uh, I didn't get to Chuck McClelland. So love this running back room. A lot of talent. This is certainly not going to be the group that holds this team back. And if anything, I think uh, Derrick Henry is going to continue to carry a lot of the weight for this offense, be a rare kind of game changing running back. There's not a lot of them that really do elevate an offense. And I think Henry is definitely one of those. So a, a well-earned ranking of second in the league. And then uh, with the quarterback run multiplier, they haven't tapped too much into Ryan Tannehill. I would be curious with more of a shotgun-oriented offense if they want to do a little bit more read option. Tannehill famously played wide receiver at Texas A&M. I think he could handle more read option, and if they do tap into that more, this would be more of a you know, 1%, maybe 1.5% boost. But it just hasn't been something Tennessee's done a lot of, uh, and I wouldn't expect it. You also have Malik Willis there. They could do some Wildcat stuff with him. He is a really talented runner, so keep an eye out for that. And um, Will Levis is uh, kind of similar to Tannehill. Big, strong, decently fast guy, um, but nothing overwhelming as far as ball carrier creativity or lateral shiftiness or anything like that. But now we have to talk about this offensive line, and uh, it's it's kind of a tough discussion to have. You know, it's 
32nd ranking in pass blocking, 32nd in run blocking. I'm much more worried about this group than I would be about the the receivers, honestly. Like, I think the receiver group, as long as they can stay healthy, there's talent there to help them do what they want to do a little bit. The offensive line here, like, I think they're going to have plenty of issues, especially if they're getting to more drop back passing stuff, which we've talked about. But let's get through it. Uh, at left tackle, I do like the Andre Dillard signing. Basically, I don't think he's going to be a problem. I, I like what he's going to do in pass protection. I don't think he's going to be a you know top 10 tackle or anything elite like that, but he was a first-round pick for good reason. He's got really smooth feet, good pass protection technique, not the strongest player he can lose against power, um, but I don't think he's going to be getting Ryan Tannehill killed from the blind side like what was happening last year. So I do think that's a massive upgrade to this offensive line. Like, if this is the 32nd-ranked offensive line this year, last year's Titans offensive line would have ranked, like, you know, 48th, if that were possible. It was brutal. So just having a non-turnstile at left tackle is going to be a relief for this offense. So that's what I'm expecting from Andre Dillard, is just to be solid. And I think giving him the money they paid him in free agency to be that is going to be something you're totally fine with, especially after what this team went through last year. Not the best run blocker. I mentioned some of the play strength stuff. He, he's just not a people mover, was never a great uh, run blocker, even going back to his college days. So it's just not something I'm expecting from him, something that I think they signed him for. Um, but I think he can surprise a lot of people because when they signed him, there's a lot of pushback on that contract. He's He got put behind Jordan Maialato, who was one of the biggest breakout players in the last couple of years that just overtook Andre Dillard's path as a first-round player who was getting better. So I'm excited to see what he can do. Peter Skoronsky at left guard also feel, feel very solid about what he's going to be. Uh, I wish they would play him at right tackle personally. <laughs> and I have to interject after the initial recording here because I recorded this the morning of some breaking news. Nicholas petit Ferrer was part of the wave of gambling suspensions here. And it's funny, after sitting down, analyzing this, breaking it down, I went on this tangent about I kind of wish they would try other options at right tackle. I kind of wish, having spent the 11th pick on Peter Skoronsky, that they would maybe give him a try at right tackle, because I really just was not all that impressed by Nicholas petit Frere. So it could end up being a blessing disguise depending on how they want to handle this because I think Skoransky, if he plays right tackle, will probably be good at it and ultimately give them the best offensive line for this season in a roundabout way. And maybe Petit Ferrer comes in and plays guard. I, I don't know. It, it wouldn't be enough to change their offensive line rankings because they're pretty far behind in terms of pass protection for me. Uh, compared to the 31st ranked team, but I do think it would be actually a better slotted group with giving Skaronsky a shot at right tackle first. Um, now, that is completely up in the air. This is all new information, and we're going to have to wait and see where that goes because I wasn't the biggest Nicholas Petit Ferrer guy based on what he did for them last year, but uh, Skaronsky as a guard, in theory, should be a dominant guard. I mean, he is scrappy, is technically sound, uh, he, he gets great leverage. He's like six foot four. The arm length stuff is kind of why he's being pushed inside. And, you know, I think he's going to be a stud. Reminds me a lot of Elijah Vera Tucker who slid into guard, though I think Skaronsky is more technically sound in pass protection. He's not, not going to have the hiccups that Vera Tucker has had in pass pro. So on the left side, it's going to be substantially better than what they had last year. From center to right tackle, I'm not sure it's going to be an upgrade. So they have Aaron Brewer who started at left guard for them last year, you're now just moving that problem to center. And what's interesting here to me is Aaron Brewer is in theory, a pretty not in theory, he is literally a good run-blocking offensive lineman because he's insanely athletic. He plays at about 285 pounds. He's tiny, but he gets leverage. He flies off the ball. Uh, you know, um, force equals mass times acceleration, and he brings a lot of acceleration to the run game. But specifically a fit as a wide zone blocker. Have you heard me talk about that before? If they're not running a lot of wide zone, I don't see the practicality in Aaron Brewer as a starting offensive lineman unless he's putting on a bunch of weight because 
when defensive linemen can get their hands on him and he's not catching them off guard on those on the move wide zone schemes, they can control him with relative ease. It's it's like he's basically a tight end size. Like there are tight ends, I think, that carry more raw mass than Aaron Brewer in the NFL. So I know you can protect centers with double teams. And I guess if you're going to play him anywhere, you want him at center where obviously in a double team situation, offensive uh, defensive lineman can't control him in that way. Um, but if teams can isolate him one-on-one, I'm worried that, I mean, if you can get Chris Jones or Jeffrey, uh, sorry, Jeffrey Simmons is on this team, but say Quinn and Williams, just one-on-one on Aaron Brewer, or those teams like, you know, Zadarius Smith, for example, in Cleveland, like just lining Zadarius Smith up over Aaron Brewer, I don't think he can hang one-on-one in pass protection. So it's interesting that they're kind of leaning on him as their center right now. That's not to say they don't have other alternatives. Daniel Brunskill has snapped the ball before. Corey Levin can play center, I think, is a little bit more sound in pass protection, is a little bit more size to him. I also wouldn't be stunned if they bring Ben Jones back, who started 10 games for them last year. That would definitely help. I don't know if that would help them rank anything um, any higher than 32nd. It, it might be close, but it certainly would be eliminating their weakest link, I think. Uh, going to be something to keep an eye on for sure. Uh, right guard, Daniel Brunskill. I did like this signing. They got him on a pretty good deal. Just someone that started a million games. But again, a million games in a wide zone blocking scheme. So how does that balance come in? He's a very good athlete. Gets really good leverage on the move. Good at pass protecting when they're resetting the pocket and running play action and all that stuff. But head up as a pass blocker, that's where he's had his issues. So I, I don't think it was a bad signing. I think if he were your weak link, as he's been in San Francisco for a couple of offensive lines, you can live with it. Um, but as someone you're kind of counting on to be a starting caliber right guard, don't love it. And then we have to interject again with Nicholas Petit Frere being the uh, originally slated starter at right tackle. But news comes down today after this original recording that he's going to be suspended for the first six games of the season. And it, it really is funny, like listening to what I said originally, I was trying to find roundabout ways for them to go with a better option at right tackle because I really was underwhelmed by what he did for the Titans last year. A lot of the same issues he showed me at Ohio State still showing up in his rookie season. And of course, like, yeah, that can always be improved upon and all that. But to count on that as a starting right tackle is just going to be cause for concern and a potential liability. And those concerns were being disconnected in pass protection, not landing his hands with accuracy, letting his feet lag behind, losing to the corner, uh, not protecting his chest where he would lose against power rushers. Really a up and down season in pass protection to say the least. And for me, they had convinced themselves that they wanted to give him another year at right tackle, but I think they might be forced. Uh, I think their hand might be forced here and it might lead to them making a better personnel decision with this offensive line. And because they have solid interior depth, I think the move is Peter Skaronsky to right tackle, which we talked about. We'll see what they decide to do there. But even if that's not what they go with, like, I think Jamarco Jones can be basically the same player as Nicholas Petit, uh, Nicholas Petit Ferrer, where it's a lateral move for six weeks, and then you just slide Ferrer back in after the suspension and hope that that growth and development uh, comes for Ferrer in year two, which again is very possible, but I just don't think you want to count on what he's given you at right tackle. But I think Dylan Radins. This is a really great opportunity for him, who was a tackle coming out of North Dakota State. I think he's kind of put himself on this coaching staff's shit list, but if this is a huge opportunity for him to win this right tackle job, I thought he was much better in the final you know, six games of last season or so when they had to kind of turn to him. And I think he's a more athletic, more polished player uh, offensive lineman than Petit Ferrer with higher upside. You know, he was a second round pick. Petit Ferrer was a third round pick. Not that that is exact math, but um, I definitely think those grades were fair where those guys ended up getting drafted. So I'm not done giving up on Dylan Radins. I already had those eyes, the watch list type of, uh, you know, note on them before this suspension. But to me, that could be a huge blessing in disguise if that opportunity opens the door for him. 
And then, you know, I, I think Daniel Brunskill has played right tackle. I know he has, but I think he could be an upgrade at right tackle where you could slide Corey Levin in there on the interior offensive line. And Levin's actually a little interesting to me, not in like a huge way, but he was a sixth round pick out of Chattanooga all the way back in 2017. He got one start basically in 2018 and kind of shit the bed. And he hasn't really gotten an opportunity since then, but four years later here, he's still hanging around and he gets three starts at center the last three games of the season and actually played pretty well for this team. So there might be something there in just a small school guy that has been developing and waiting on that opportunity. And even someone like John Leglu was a decent pickup where he started four games for the Pittsburgh Steelers a couple years ago and was okay. So like, to me, I think they were being a little bit silly, uh, locking in Petit Ferrer at right tackle, which is really what it felt like was gonna happen. And I think this is gonna force their hand to potentially improve this offensive line. Not enough to uh, climb them out of the 32nd ranking in either pass blocking or run blocking. They're just too far behind there and the options aren't good enough. But especially in the scenario where Skaronsky becomes, uh, Skaronsky becomes a franchise tackle who you spent the 11th pick on as opposed to a franchise guard, you are now getting significantly more capital uh, returned to you for that draft pick. And I definitely think he can handle it because he was a lockdown tackle in the Big Ten at left tackle. Definitely fascinating, uh, especially when a uh, team's hand is kind of forced when you at a, at a specific spot that you already disagreed with their decision to go with that guy. Um, the only other guy we didn't talk about is Jalen Duncan, who they spent a sixth round pick. I would be floored if they went to him. He is a complete disaster in both phases of the game, a complete draft and develop offensive lineman. It's going to be Dennis Daly all over again if that's really what they want to do. So there's your interjection for the suspension. Um, we do factor in the skill blockers for that run block grade. I love having Nick Westbrook Akine. I'll come back to the scheme fit thing. Like he's great blocking down on wide zone. How much are they going to play him from the slot? Like to me, they have Kyle Phillips coming back. He's more of a slot guy. Westbrook Akine is still a good blocker on the outside, but it's that's not as impactful as blocking close to the line of scrimmage like he's good at. So they have him. He's a booster to this all, uh, but uh, beyond that, not a whole lot of like notable skill blockers for them. So that wraps up the offense. Definitely an interesting group. A lot of question marks to say the least. They're going to come out 32nd in the passing game. Not a surprise when he ranked dead last in weaponry and pass blocking. And Ryan Tannehill is not a quarterback that's going to drag them out of that. Uh, run game, I think, is going to be much better. You know, I, I think... The run blocking in general is less of a liability than the pass blocking is for them, even if they do rank 32nd. And of course, you have the Derrick Henry factor here. So 15th in the run game, 28th for overall offense. I think they do have a decent floor with the run game there, but I don't know how much higher their ceiling is than that. Like I think a lot of the offenses that ranked below them probably all have higher ceilings than the Tennessee Titans do. But... I, I am, and I think we can all take a deep sigh of relief because we can trust this defense a lot more. They've got a lot of depth. They don't have any true weaknesses, as we'll see. And they have some really good players back there, too. And they're, as we know, incredibly well coached. So whew, less uh, difficult conversations to be had. And we can put a smile on our face as we look at this D-line that I can't wait to watch this defensive line. They're going to rank 15th in pass rush, 13th in run defense, very respectable rankings there, and really just solid across the board. Let's start with the edge group. You get Harold Landry back, who's not a superstar, but within this system, he puts up superstar numbers because number one, Mike Vrabel loves to run stunts. That's why he has Danico Autry here. It's why they bring in an Arden Key, who's been a stunt master, if you will, in San Francisco and Jacksonville. They want to run crosses and slants and scheme up open opportunities for Harold Landry to bend around either the edge unblocked or bend around the guard on a loop unblocked where he's about as good at anybody at creating angles for himself and accelerating into areas. And that's why his pass rushing grade isn't amazing per PFF. It usually floats around 65, 
because in one-on-one -on -one opportunities, he's not amazing. He's pretty good. He can win on inside moves. He can win with bend. Not a lot of true power there. But within this scheme, he has he is an absolute weapon, and they really were missing this piece last year. So getting him back is a really nice addition for this team, really. He's an okay run defender. Actually, he really sidesteps blocks well and has good instincts. But again, the play strength isn't great there. He's now been... Um, he's had now like what 15 months to recover from the ACL is that no that's bad math he'll, he'll have a full year he got hurt in like August so he should be fully recovered from the ACL injury and I'm expecting full go for Harold Landry it's not like he has some history of knee injuries or anything I think he's still in his physical prime uh, so I I'm expecting full go on Harold Landry mentioned Arden Key coming in as a stunt master Kind of a luxury addition here, honestly, because Danico Autry is is really the second best edge here. But they bring in Arden Key to be just kind of a secret weapon for this pass rush. I, I really think about him on those stunts where he's got rare length and get off and he can blow up uh, blockers and be that sort of Occupy man on those stunts where you can create looping opportunities for guys like Jeffrey Simmons or even Harold Landry. If you want to put Arden Key in as like a 4-I, they'll do that with Harold Landry on the opposite edge. They're going to move him around. They're going to find mismatches for him. And he's just going to be a handful. He's also grown to be a pretty solid run defender. He's kind of like a poor man Samson Abukum in a lot of ways. He's, he's played that scheme in San Francisco, did some similar stuff for Jacksonville last year. He was like a five-star recruit once upon a time that just really didn't get it early on in his career. Didn't work out in Las Vegas as like a third-round pick. But I think he's matured a lot, and it's showing on the field. I don't know that he's ever going to turn into like a star, but this was a pretty sneaky addition. They gave him a decent contract, like three years, 21, and he's going to make an impact for these guys. I think he's going to give them more than Bud Dupree did last year, and that's probably not something a lot of people would expect to hear. But Danico Autry is kind of that hybrid end, you know, when they go to, you know, he'll play anywhere from a three tech to a five tech, depending on what sorts of fronts they want to run. But he's awesome. And he's another guy that missed a lot of time last year, really between Autry, Simmons, Landry, Bud Dupree. These guys all were hurt in and out of the lineup last year. If they can get healthier, this is going to be game changing for this defense that was still good last year. But Danico Autry is a necessity for this scheme because as someone that can line up on the interior, he's as fast off the ball and as, as, as disruptive as, as you can ask for a four eye. And the combo of him and, and Harold Landry is something that Mike Vrabel is really, um, you know, built this defense around and it was unavailable to them last year. So simply put as a disruptor, he's got a ton of value here, but he can win one on one. He's got pass rush moves. He's got power. He can come from a wide alignment. He can win on the inside against guards. He's a weapon, man. He's an underrated player. He's really the archetype player in the NFL for the quality starting hybrid defensive end. He's a good run defender, too especially when they play him off the edge. If they're in base nickel and he's playing as a five tech or even like a little bit wider than that, you know, he's a complete handful for any sort of, especially tight end, but a tackle to block. And then you also have Rashad Weaver, who was kind of forced into starting uh, a starting role last year. And now he's their fourth. It's a guy that had 35 pressures, a handful of sacks last year. He's a lengthy guy who's a really good run defender rare bend for a guy his size not the fastest off the ball not necessarily going to threaten with speed doesn't have immense power or anything like that but he's crafty and uh just kind of instinctive at getting after the quarterback so i, I don't you know he never really had incredible upside to be a high-end starter but again as a fourth edge that's some of the best depth in the league and that's why they don't have a whole lot after that sam i'm gonna give it my best shot okwai nonu I believe is how we're going to go with that one. Uh, he got some snaps last year. He's kind of that bigger body Danico Autry backup, if you will. Maybe makes the team, maybe hangs around in the practice squad in case Autry goes down. It's a pretty specific role that Autry fills. He doesn't necessarily need a rotational backup, but he can hang uh, as a run defender, at least. 
And then uh, the only other guy that's interesting to me really is Caleb Murphy. He had like 25 sacks in his last year at Ferris State. Knows what he's doing. It's just a matter of does he have the physical tools to let that translate to the next level. But if he makes the team, I'm definitely keeping my eyes on him. But it's not just a good edge group. You've got a really good interior group, at least with the starters. Obviously, Jeffrey Simmons is a superstar. And what's crazy about Jeffrey Simmons is he got the big contract extension, fully well-deserved, but he probably hasn't reached his ceiling yet. He was looking like he was going to have that sort of like borderline defensive player of the year caliber season last year for the first half of the year, but gets hurt, missed some games, was playing hurt, was not nearly as effective at about that week 10 mark on. So we're still waiting to see a full-fledged, you know, 90 pressure, 15 sack season, that truly elite season from him. We've seen those elite stretches, certainly, and the tape reinforces the fact that he's capable of it, but you can't rank him as, a, as an elite player until he plays at that level, right? So I put the arrow pointing up on him because I think it's going to happen this year, pending health for him and the rest of these guys around him. And he's one of those guys that demands a double team, which makes manufacturing and scheming up stunts even easier on um, uh, for Mike Vrabel. Like, it can be really as simple as, and I'm, I'm not a defensive coordinator. I've never drawn up stunts and put them to action. But pretty much, like, you can say, all right, let's put Jeffrey Simmons. He's going to demand a, a double team as, like, a, a two-eye. So the center and the guard are going to have to take Jeffrey Simmons. We'll put him there. We'll put Autry and Landry running a stunt on the other side. Going to cause chaos for the guard and the tackle. And then, hey, let's blitz the A-gap. What are they going to do? The back has to come in that way. Good luck handling the stunt, the blitzer, and Jeffrey Simmons all together. With, oh, by the way, Arden Key and Rashad Weaver as good cleanup guys in the back end. Like, this is going to be a really fun pass rush. Um, there's a lot of good pass rushes in the league. 15th might even sound a little bit low. And I could honestly get behind that. I think when you factor in the scheme, um, it's probably going to produce higher than the highest, uh, the 15th best pass rush, but that's why we rank defensive coaching and why it factors into the whole overall scale, right? Uh, this is more like on paper, 15th best pass rushing roster in the league. Continuing to go through the interior linemen, uh, Jeffrey Simmons is a very good run defender. Not necessarily what he's known for, but awesome at it. Uh, Tyre Tart next to him is another player we got to focus on here. He is uh, someone that we, we do uh, sup superlatives with James Foster in our interview here, and he was my unsung hero of this team. He is awesome on film. He's a true nose tackle, a space eater. I think one of the genuinely underrated players in this league. Uh, had a really good year last year. Uh, Titans, uh, the Titans and Titans fans understand the value that he brings to the table, especially in the run game. But, hey, he can do some stuff as a pass rusher, too. He's not completely useless out there. So I, I really just loved watching Tyre Tart. Was, every time he was out there, I was like, man, he is just doing his job. Not going to rack up stats or you know flood the box score, but he opens up everything for this, this defensive line and these linebackers who they allow to just run free and clean stuff up. So... He's kind of the last guy that just makes this a really fun, complete defensive line. And I could see him having a breakout year uh, kind of in the Grover Stewart breath of, you know, Grover was never the biggest name guy coming into the league, but now we view him as one of the better nose tackles in the league. I think Tyre Tart can get to that level. As far as the interior depth, it's not nearly what they have on the edge. I do like Naquan Jones. He know, he's another guy that as every time I watch Titans film, he's out there like 10 plays a game, and I feel like he is a very physical, tough guy to move. Michigan State guy, kind of that Big Ten defender uh, personality there. Given the development they are able to have with this position group, I think Naquan Jones and really the faith they're having in him as the de facto backup defensive tackle – uh, I think he he could be due for a good year to emerge as a quality third player. Beyond that, I don't like a lot of these guys. You know, Jaden Peavy's barely played. Tyler Shelvin, I liked him coming out of LSU, but he hasn't been able to stick. He's been on a couple rosters now and huge nose tackle, but I just don't know if he has that um, dog in him, <laughs> if you will. 
Uh, Jaleel Johnson, he's bounced around the league as a fourth or a fifth defensive tackle. I don't think you're expecting anything more than that. Big body dude that can occasionally uh, occasionally get off a block and stop a run. But it is a pretty thin interior group. Of course, Danico Autry will uh, rotate inside a little bit. But if there's a criticism of this group, it would be interior depth. Really balanced, complete group. Even if they rank uh, just slightly above average there with 15th in pass rush, 13th in D-line run defense, this to me is, because of how they're schemed up, going to be one of the most fun defensive lines just to watch on film. A lot of different skill sets here. And then we get to the second level. And, I mean, viewers of this channel are not going to be surprised to hear me rave about Monty Rice. I did it coming out of the draft where, honestly, I had a second to a third round grade on Monty Rice. Pretty much the same grade I had on N'Kobe Dean, but I actually think Monty Rice was slightly faster and slightly more instinctive in coverage than N'Kobe Dean. And I'm not trying to dog down N'Kobe Dean. Yes, that pun was intended, and I'm proud of it, so you better like it. But <laughs> um, I, that just speaks volumes to how I feel about Monty Rice. And it was so fun for me and any Monty Rice fans out there to see the second David Long went down, Monty Rice steps in, boom, they barely missed a beat. And that's saying a lot because David Long had an excellent year last year, but Rice was flying around the field, tracking down plays in the backfield, doing everything Mike Vrabel could ever ask of these, these linebackers to just fly around. You know, Mike Vrabel basically says, I'm going to do my job schematically, and our defensive line is going to do their job physically up front to open things up. We're going to occupy the offensive linemen, and it is your job to find the ball. So play fast, be a headhunter out there, and have fun, really. Like, it shows that the style of play that Vrabel allows these linebackers to play with allows these guys to thrive. And it's helped pretty much everybody that's come through here. Jayon Brown, Zach Cunningham, uh, obviously David Long, and I think it's going to do the same thing for Monty Rice. I think it's one of the most linebacker-friendly systems in the entire league. And I think when you look at a guy who, to me, was like the epitome of coming out of Georgia in, with Monty Rice, um, the epitome of covers players, not grass. He understands that you can't just stand there in your hook zone and let the quarterback manipulate you. Eventually, you got to turn and run. So I, I think the coverage can absolutely continue to improve. I think he showed flashes there last year. And I, I would say his upside is even higher than David Long because I think he's a better athlete. So I'm really excited for Monty Rice to get his opportunity. I'm going to be making a breakout video, a top 10 breakout players in the NFL video probably in uh, August. And I think Monty Rice might be number one. We'll see. But like that's really how enthusiastic I am for him to get this chance this year. Can't rank him too high. He's played 500 career snaps, but saying I'm excited to see how he plays is the understatement of the series. Um, they also bring in Aziz Alshair, who I think has, you could echo a lot of the same kind of narrative with Monty Rice, where like Alshair has shown that he can play when he's gotten opportunities He's been behind Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw. So he's basically only played as a weak side backer and occasionally when one of those guys goes down. But I know it's a different front in San Francisco, but the way that uh, they D'Amico Ryans has allowed them to play a linebacker back there is uh, over there in San Francisco is very similar, where they're going to open things up by running stunts and games up front, and it's on the linebackers to find the football and keep that discipline while they do so. And uh, I think Al Shair is going to be a very comfortable fit here. Uh, kind of a prove-it contract that he signed here. And he's got breakout potential in his own right. So both these guys, I think, have athletic upside. They'd certainly have the potential to shatter these rankings. I just can't rank them too high because they're unproven. But I really am not worried about either of these players, especially inside this scheme, like I said, that has protected these, not necessarily protected these linebackers, but helped them thrive and develop. Uh, they also bring in Ben Neiman, who's a nice little insurance policy, who has actually started a lot more games than these guys. If you're not getting what you were hoping for in either of these players, I think Neiman can step in and be okay, just like he was for the Cardinals last year. I was pleasantly surprised with how solid he was for them. I, you know, Throughout the course of the year, I was like, 
why are you playing Ben Neiman over Isaiah Simmons and, and Zayvon Collins? I watched the film and I was like, I kind of get it. Like, he's a veteran. He's in the right place at the right time. He's not really bad in any regard, just not an explosive player. Behind Neiman, it's really just all unproven. You got Chance Campbell, who was drafted in the fifth round last year. Uh, blitzing is is his strong suit, still trying to learn how to defend the run and cover. You got Luke Gifford, kind of a special teamer, Jack Gibbons. Uh, he played a couple games for this team last year and was okay. Wouldn't be surprised if Vrabel likes him and he makes the team. Uh, also pick up Otis Reese as an undrafted pickup. We'll see if he makes it. But it's kind of an optimistic outlook, really. Even if they rank towards the bottom, I think these guys are are definitely going to uh, basically leave the season ranking much better than 26th and 27th for linebacker rankings. But then we get to the secondary. It's another really good group, right? You got three starting corners that I think are pretty reliable at this point. Christian Fulton, who does need to stay healthy. That's been a thing for him. But when he's out there, I see him as just a really sound, ideally number two corner. Fluid hips, great man-to-man -man technique. I think he's gotten better year by year in zone coverage. Physical at the catch point. Not the fastest guy. He's got decent size. But, you know, the physical tools are probably going to prohibit him from being a high-end starter. Um, but if he can have a good year, I think he deserves to be paid in that kind of, you know, three years, 35 million range as a good quality starting number two corner. Pretty physical against the run, too, which you like. Uh, and then they bring in Sean Murphy Bunting, which initially felt to me like a luxury signing. But as I was putting this together, I was like, oh, no, that was that was a really good kind of necessary signing because, you know, they needed a third corner that can run man-to-man. -man. And Trey Avery showed some flashes of that as an undrafted pickup last year. Caleb Farley's been a complete bust. Uh, Elijah Molden's a good dime back, but has always been more of a zone-heavy guy that they're even thinking about making a safety at this point. Chris Jackson was a seventh-round pick in 2020 that's been really more bad than good when he's played. So, like, you have depth, but they needed another quality starter out there, especially if they want to run the amount of man-to-man, -man, cover one that they want to, and now they're going to be allowed to do that. But I don't think this signing just raises the floor for what the Titans can and want to do. But I think from Sean Murphy Bunting's perspective, this was such a great place to go if the market wasn't there for a big contract. You know, last year in Tampa, he was hurt to start the year they bring him back off the injury and put him right in the slot where, to me, he's just at his best on the outside, man-to-man, -man, protect the sideline, use that vertical speed. To me, that's where his best tape is. And they stick him in the slot the first few games back, like week nine, I want to say. Had a rough game week 10 against Seattle. Uh, and then, you know, they kind of put him back on the outside. And his stretch to end the year was really impressive looking again like that high upside player that coming out of the draft i said his physical pro comp is darius slay he's got those type of physical tools with the length and the speed and the movement ability i mean he's kind of in that caleb farley territory of like just it's really hard to find these types of traits at the cornerback position he's only 26 years old was super young coming into the league and i really think in this system where I do think they will play him outside, let him run a lot of man-to-man -man with a good pass rush in front of him, great defensive coaching. Sean Murphy Bunting could easily break out this year as a you know, number one corner and earn a massive contract either here in Tennessee or someone else. So he's had his ups and downs. He's kind of like been a week-to-week -week corner. He's had a lot of injuries and sometimes, you know, just... Like I said, they'll put him in the slot where he's not as comfortable. Um, he doesn't quite have those instincts. He's not the most physical run defender. Just put him on the outside. Let him do his thing, and I think he will eat out there. So really a nice signing there, I think. Certainly an upgrade from Terrence Mitchell and the motley crew of injured corners that they were rotating in and out. And I think that's going to upgrade uh, upgrade Roger McCreary, who McCreary kind of had to be this team's number one corner last year for a lot of the season because Fulton was hurt. Uh, you know, he was their next best guy, and he was okay. He was kind of the satisfying 
feeling of he was exactly as advertised. They took him in the second round, and I was like, yeah, I mean, he's going to be a solid starting caliber corner. He's not the fastest guy. He's not the biggest guy. He will lose because he will have a physical disadvantage against most of the receivers he's going against, but really technically sound physical man-to-man corner. He could slide into the slot a lot more this year and have more success. I think he's going to be very comfortable in there. Um, so he goes from like their number one to their number three. Like that's a massive upgrade in the secondary for this Titans team that I don't think enough people are talking about really across the board. And then you do have depth after that. So Elijah Molden is kind of a hybrid corner safety at this point. I always felt like long term after they took Roger McCreary, they were going to be transitioning him to safety was such a zone heavy corner at Washington and just doesn't have the speed or size, <clears throat> excuse me, for a team that loves man to man to really project uh, project long term as a man to man cornerback. So as a dime back, I think he will he will get on the field in their dime packages. And as a guy that can run man to man on tight ends or match him up on slower receivers or uh, run zones in the intermediate of the field, he can be a really instinctive player and fill into a nice role there. But then you now have Trey Avery, who was asked to start a lot last year as an undrafted pickup out of Rutgers, and he held up really well for an undrafted pickup. So for him to now be kind of your fourth like true corner really is is pretty solid depth at this point. I liked what we saw from him last year, but I don't think they clearly wanted to start him necessarily. Uh, then Caleb Farley, anything you get from him at this point is house money. I mean, he's just been a complete colossal flop of a first round pick. The physical tools were there at Virginia Tech like four years ago. They haven't really shown at the NFL level, and there's been really no even coverage upside from Caleb Farley to this point. So first round pick kind of falling by the wayside here. And then we kind of mentioned Chris Jackson earlier as a special teamer. If he makes the team, whatever. He's a good physical defensive back, but um, now you shouldn't have to play Chris Jackson, which is probably a relief for Titans fans. So a really good corner room, even if you don't have any superstars. Um, but you do have a superstar in the safety room with Kevin Bayard, who to me is in the conversation with three or four safeties in the league for the best safety in the league. And it's tough to even pick one because safeties are asked to do so many different things. You know, I think if you want a rangy free safety, Jesse Bates, maybe Minka Fitzpatrick are your number one safety. If you want a physical run defender, Derwin James, probably your number one safety. If you want a guy that can do both those things at a near elite level, Kevin Byard's your guy. Completely balanced skill set. And honestly, he's like an A at everything. Like, he's fantastic. He might even be my pick for the best safety in the NFL because of the scheme flexibility he provides for you. They'll put him down in the box. He can go man-to-man -man on tight ends. He can go hook zones. He can definitely play single high free safety. He doesn't quite have the range as Jesse Bates and Minka Fitzpatrick, but he'll still make plays and be a damn good player back there. And you put him down in the box, defend the run. He's willing. He's got good size. Is he Derwin James or Jamal Adams? No, but he's better than most. You know what I'm saying? So, like, he, to me, is still the best overall player that this team has. I think Jeffrey Simmons certainly has the upside to surpass Bayard this year and because he's a pass rusher he's a more impactful valuable player but as far as rating players Kevin Bayard's freaking awesome man another great year last year probably a guy that doesn't get the respect he deserves on a national scale like I remember uh was it Deion Sanders didn't even know who he was like two years ago when he was an all-pro safety so, like, that's a good example of what we're talking about there. But uh, next to him, you have Amani Hooker, who's kind of a poor man's Kevin Bayard, honestly. Really smart, physical guy, good cover player, not a great cover player, good run defender, not a great run defender. As a number two safety in a system that allows him to do what he does well, which is man up tight ends, patrol the middle of the field, you know, they'll, they'll go quarters and he's a good quarters safety because he, he played a lot of slot corner at Iowa. Very similar skill set there. If they go single high, usually it's Bayard playing free safety just because Hooker doesn't quite have that range and speed to do a lot of that single high stuff. But other than that, Hooker can pretty much do anything at a pretty high level. And then 
a big reason I think Molden is more of a safety than he is a corner for this year and beyond is look at this safety depth entirely unproven group none of these guys have played like at all Josh Thompson Mike Brown Tyreek Jones Matthew Jackson I would be surprised if they don't pick somebody up I don't know necessarily who that would be but I would be surprised if they don't bring in a little bit of veteran insurance there Um, but at this point in time I think if one of these two guys went down I think you're looking at putting Elijah Molden in there as an actual safety but I really like this secondary. It's complete. They rank 13th. Not necessarily any game changers. You know, Bayard is a great safety. It's it's hard to be a true game changer as a safety. I think it's easier to do that as a corner. But if there is a game changer, it's Kevin Bayard. And then beyond that, it's just a bunch of good starters. And if Sean Murphy Bunting can have a good consistent season in a, on a one-year contract prove it, prove it deal and become Darius Slay, this is definitely a top five secondary probably. They're also pretty good in run support. They rank kind of towards the middle in uh, in that tier three being uh, that good tier. So that wraps up the defense where overall they're going to come out as the ninth ranked defense. That's definitely their floor, right? We're ranking the pass rush at their floor. We're ranking the linebackers at their floor, the corners at their floor. If they're any worse than the ninth defense in the in, in the in the NFL this year, I will be stunned. Like I think with this coaching, with this complete of a roster, the health that they have this year compared to last year, I think it's going to be eye opening for a lot of people. Still a couple a uh, couple of things that need to you know land on the right side of the coin, as we mentioned, if this is going to be an elite defense. But I think that upside is there. Like if Jeffrey Simmons becomes Chris Jones, if these linebackers break out. If Sean Murphy Bunting breaks out, this can be an elite defense and a defense that honestly surprises enough for this team to compete for the playoffs and and maybe compete for this division. As far as the splits are concerned, by the way, they're ninth in pass defense, 11th in run defense, very balanced in both regards. This defense is going to be a pain in the ass to play against. I can promise you that. Uh, So to wrap everything up into a nice little ribbon here before we get to our interview with James uh obviously ranking 23rd overall as a team they are dragged down pretty significantly by being the 28th ranked offense the defense is going to have to do pretty much all of the heavy lifting here as the offense figures things out this year and the special teams is also in question because of the kicker situation they've got a competition right now between Caleb Shudak and Trey Wolf so we'll find out if these guys can make their kicks Uh, They also don't have like any notable kick returners, really. Right now, it's looking like Kyle Phillips and Julius Chestnut are going to be the uh, return men. But let's recap their strengths and weaknesses. Team culture is their overwhelming strength. They have that team buy-in and that they've earned that benefit of the doubt. You've got the Derrick Henry factor. I still think he's a game-changing running back that you have got to game plan for. And it's not just game planning. Like You have to kind of deal with the physical wear on your you know the the wear down effect of Derrick Henry I think it's real I think this is a really good fourth quarter team that wins a lot of close games because of Derrick Henry um, for a variety of reasons I, I think not having a weakness on defense is a strength like I know they ranked pretty low at linebacker but I certainly don't think that'll be a, a weakness of this defense will it be a dominating strength I don't know but it's definitely not gonna be a, a weak point Uh, And then defensive coaching, of course, like they're going to scheme you up. They're going to know what you want to do, attack what you want to do, and just make things, like I said, a pain in the ass to go against uh, physically and schematically. As far as the weaknesses are concerned, it's pretty damn straightforward. It's all in the offense, the offensive line, the lack of weaponry, and honestly, the biggest potential weakness for me is going to be that clash of scheme and all of these skill sets, all of these guys, Derrick Henry, Ryan Tannehill, Chigo Conquo, Traylon Burks, Nick Westbrook-Akine, their key offensive players were all put in place to run wide zone. So how does Tim Kelly balance that? If it if he forces the, his scheme onto this team, I think there's a world where these guys can't handle it well. This is the worst offense in the league, and that's when they're playing more at their floor uh, as a team where they're maybe only winning five games this year. I think that's their floor, though, because this defense is just going to be too good, and they're going to be in way too many close games. 
let's take a look at their schedule then. Uh, with that said, so their Vegas over under is seven and a half wins. They are an AFC team, so they're going to have a lot of difficult games. Now, they do get to play the NFC South, which to me is probably the weakest NFC division, at least as far as top end talent is concerned. I think all four of those NFC South games are very much winnable. Their own division is also rather weak. I think they'll be favored in both the Texans games, though they'll be tough fights. They tend to play up to the Jags. Like, I know the Jags are really good, but I don't think they're going to just steamroll the Titans. I think they still are trying to reach that level of physicality that the Titans bring. And they always seem to go to overtime every game against the Colts. So we know those are going to be tough. That's 10 games there that are, you know, pretty winnable. Beyond that, it's rough. You've got the Chargers at the Browns, the Bengals, the Ravens at the Dolphins. I think they will all be big underdogs in those games. You also have to go to Pittsburgh, which is not going to be easy for them. That's going to be a total slugfest. And then they host Seattle, which I think they'll also be underdogs against. Though I do think they match up well um, as far as uh, the line play being kind of in Tennessee's favor a little bit. But yeah, um, tough schedule. I don't know if I'm betting the over or under on this team. I would lean over. I really would. But there's a floor with this team, with the offense that is scary. Um, it's going to be really close. My my model has them coming out at 7.6 wins. So kind of right on the nose there. I think if I'm betting the Titans, it's probably the division odds. They're second right now, which I think is the right place for them. Plus 380. If something happens to the Jags, like if if they fall off or don't take a step forward, um, you know, like if the Jags are exactly what they were last year, I think the Titans probably win this division. But we think that the Jags are building something moving forward, right? But if they don't take a step up or, God forbid, they have an injury-ridden season, I think the Titans very well could win this division. So, you know, plus 380, I think those odds are fair, but I don't think it's a bad bet if you want to, you know, put a little money on the Titans to surprise some people this year. That's probably where the money is for me. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed. This one's definitely going to be another long one. Um, we're going to include James here at the end of this. Uh, do not skip it. James knows his stuff, man. Uh, so we are going to bring in James. I'm going to say my goodbyes right here. Thank you for watching. Please do drop a like. Uh, comment what you think, where I'm right, where I'm wrong. Did I change your opinion on this Titans team a little bit? I'd love to hear it, but enjoy the interview and we'll see you for the next deep dive. And now I am super thrilled to welcome into the deep dive yet again. Is this uh year three, James, or year two? I, I year lose two. track of year these. Two. This is year yeah. two. All right. Well, welcome back for year two. We got James Foster here from A to Z Sports. You can find uh, the A to Z Sports Film Room YouTube page in the link down below also make sure you follow him on twitter a great follow uh at no flags film uh how you doing buddy thanks for thanks for coming on i'm doing great thank you for having me yeah i uh, i finally made it down to the nashville area to get uh familiarized with with titans fans and uh repping my my for the for the nashville natives i'm repping my teddy's tavern uh shirt here so um yeah love love that town definitely going to be back but uh i, I wanted to get some of your perspective on some of the news and notes that uh, us non Titans fans might be a little bit more out of the loop on uh, and go back, a, not necessarily news, but uh, a little bit back in time to December when this team moved on from the GM, John Robinson. And it was kind of a big surprise when it happened. Uh, and I, I just wanted to kind of get your take on what went down there, why they ultimately parted from John Robinson and, and was it the right decision for for the organization yeah so i was definitely surprised when he was fired um he, i didn't even really think of him as being on the hot seat or the warm seat at the time um and then i was working on a, a video like almost immediately um kind of breaking down just like what happened and i start listing out all of his bad or unsuccessful moves and once you list them all out it's kind of like yeah I, I i get it like you've got Trading away AJ Brown, um, I think it's just inexcusable. Um, there's a few teams and with specific positions where they just historically have never been able to 
draft them or find anyone successful at that position, like the Bears with quarterback. That's how the Titans are with receiver. And so A.J. Brown, you know, just simply by being good, even uh, before we really even knew how good he was, it was pretty easy to tell that he was the most talented receiver in franchise history. Um, you trade him away f- for a first round pick when it doesn't seem like you really had to. It was kind of just standard like negotiation hardball that, that was going on. Um, so that's that's the first thing that comes to mind. And then I think just getting embarrassed by the Eagles and A.J. Brown being a big part of that, that couldn't have helped. I, I don't know that it was directly um, related, like that was the, the main factor, um, but I'm sure it had an impact. I think it just like the other uh, worst moves that he made, I would say trading a sixth round pick for Dennis Daly, um, it, it might seem minor, but the fact that John Robinson supposedly watched Dennis Daly's tape from Carolina and said that we have to give a, give up a six round pick to get this guy. And then Dennis Daly ends up setting the NFL record for pressure rate allowed last season, um, ends up getting the entire quarterback room injured. Uh, you know, you've got like trading up for Des Fitzpatrick who a mm-hmm. lot of GMs and scouting departments around the um, NFL hadn't even heard of, or like wasn't even on their radar at the time. Um, as a fourth round, right? Aspect. Yep. Uh, you've got given away like $10 million guaranteed to Vic Beasley, uh, who didn't record a sack. Uh, Bud Dupree, to a lesser extent, part of his deal was injuries. But, um, you know, even when he was on the field, he wasn't incredibly productive. And then you've got first round busts like Caleb Farley and Isaiah Wilson. Um, you know, the Isaiah Wilson, I, I struggle knowing how much exactly to blame John Robinson for that, because I don't, I don't know exactly what, um, what their information was about like his off the field issues. That's always such a a difficult, a a difficult thing to really evaluate from an outsider's perspective. Cause you don't know if off field issues means like, you know, they, they skip a couple classes or they're, they're late to meetings or like they drink lean and, and, uh, dance on the top of a car in a strip mall like that's what isaiah wilson ended up doing so uh it's it's hard to know how much to blame him for that because i don't know how good his information was but yeah it was just a long series of of failed moves inability to address receiver and right tackle is really what did him in yeah man when you when you stack it up like that it definitely makes a lot more sense um and then the uh other other thing i wanted to kind of ask you was um they're they're making a big change with the offensive coordinator. I know a lot of Titans fans are probably very excited about this. I've certainly heard for a couple of years, uh, Titans fans ready to move on from Todd Downing. But I'm, as I'm sure we both know, the offensive coordinator tends to be the first scapegoat usually. Um, so they're going to go to Tim Kelly now. And uh, I'm just curious what you've kind of dug into and, and what you're kind of expecting the scheme to look like. Because I do think this is a fascinating situation where they've had so much success with the wide zone stuff, the Shanahan, the play action. Uh, you look at Derrick Henry and Tannehill still there. Do you expect um, this to be Tim Kelly's offense through and through a hybrid? Maybe he adapts the wide zone uh, to what he does. What do you, what do you think the offense is going to look like schematically? Yeah. So if you watch um, Tim Kelly, when he was last, the Texans OC, that was 2020, right? Yeah, 2020. Yeah, they were one of the gap heaviest teams in the NFL, um, and the Titans have obviously been near the top of the league in outside zone um, basically since Vrabel uh, took over, and you know that's kind of been his mo as far as the offensive coordinators that he puts in. But you look at the you look at a lot of the offensive linemen that they've added in this offseason. It's not great zone blockers like Andre Dillard, um, solid pass protector, but I don't. Like the games that I watched of him, there's very limited tape. I don't know if Philly ran wide zone one time in those games. So I guess right. I, I can't really say like uh, his ability there, but it is, it does seem to be just personnel wise. Um, you know, under John Robinson, the non negotiable with any offensive lineman that they signed was that they have to be able to block wide zone. Like we don't care if you can pass block, we don't care if you're 290 pounds. If you can block outside zone, you can be a backup. O lineman for us and um Rand Carthon has definitely taken a different approach which uh I I welcome um I think that 
if you're going to, I think my guess is that it would be more of a hybrid approach because switching to a gap scheme would kind of remove a lot of the ways that they try to marry the pass and the run together, um, like with bootlegs and stuff. And I think what Ryan Tannehill and um, Will Levis are best at is play action, throwing over the middle of the field, um, standing tough in the pocket and like hitting those shot plays. I don't know that I want them just sitting back in shotgun for 30 snaps a game and like trying to, you know, read the defense every play. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I, I think there's a, definitely a chance that that you see some more hybrid um, run scheme stuff. The thing is, is that not being able to execute outside zone has really done them in in the playoffs um the last few years because it it they'll they'll be able to go through like houston and and, you know kind of the the worst run defenses in the league and they'll put up 200 yards in the regular season but then if you get a good team that can play a five-man front and just you know take away the opportunity for double teams um take away the ability to climb to the second level and just turn outside zone into straight up one-on-one blocks Um, really the only, the only counter to that is to be able to drop back and pass, which the Titans have not been able to do or run like counter or power. And Derek Henry's not really a great gap scheme runner. He needs the wide zone, like the motion of wide zone, allowing him to build up speed as he works to the sideline that, um, that really works well with his running style. So I think, I think they have to include some wide zone in their game plan for sure. Yeah. I love how you broke that down kind of showing the upside of getting off that scheme a little bit, but definitely when you look at the skill sets, uh, it's going to be tough for them to just abandon it. I I think that's going to be the most challenging thing that the staff has to balance this year for sure Mm -hmm. uh, from a scheme point of view. Uh, So DeAndre Hopkins was in town last week or two weeks ago. I don't know. I lose track of time getting through this series, but uh, is, is that ship sailed? Do you think, or could those connections that Hopkins has, with all the guys really in, in Tennessee with, with the coaches um, come back and, and bring Hopkins home. It's hard to say. It seems like he's trying to get other offers now at this point. It just, it, it seems like Tennessee and new England are the two teams that are really pursuing him. And he's, you know, just trying to get some more offers on the table. Um, it also doesn't really seem like that's going to happen. It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of in, other interest um, and I mean, I think it's definitely a, a realistic possibility. It's hard because, you know, one report will come out and then it'll get re-reported and aggregated in all these other places and presented as if it's like a new report when it's really three weeks old. That's been happening with DeAndre Hopkins. So I, I don't know. I'm kind of just in a wait and see approach. Um, I think it would definitely, I mean, obviously raise the ceiling for the offense um, and kind of give them some breathing room with their receivers where you're not like, everyone has to stay healthy or this is going to be a disaster. Um, so, I mean, I would, I would absolutely be in favor of, of signing him. Um, and my guess is that it, it comes, I would probably go like 60, 40 new England, um, Tennessee for Deandre Hopkins. Yeah. I think it comes down to those two. Uh, all right. So let's transition a little bit to the draft. Um, and I originally had a whole list of different options and stuff. And I was looking, I was like, you know, that was a list that I threw to Zach Hicks for the Colts, and the Colts had like 12 different picks, a lot of different options. Titans are, were, were a little bit um, of a smaller draft for sure, and and you look at some of the picks they made, not necessarily like day one impact type of picks with Levis and maybe Spears a little bit being behind Henry in, in certain ways. So I just wanted to get your quick thoughts on what was your favorite pick, that pick that came off the board and you were like, yes, let's go, or um, uh, was there a pick as well? that you were just kind of like, eh, I kind of wish we went in a different direction. My favorite pick would be Will Levis. Um, he was my 10th overall player in the class. And um, I think just to be able to get him in the second round and you know really not give up major draft capital to trade back up, I think is just incredible value. Um, I know there's kind of some fatigue with that kind of scenario having just drafted Malik Willis last year and like everybody used the same logic it seems like to justify it but I I do think that Will Levis is a much better prospect than Malik Willis Um, and 
I mean, without him, like you don't have any quarterback of the future on the roster that you feel great about. So like you have to just keep investing and throwing darts at that position until you find someone. Yeah. I mean, I thought you guys were going to think about him at 11 and I'm sure they did. And, um, um I mean, Carthon's line, they asked him if they would have taken him at 11 and he said, we would have thought about it if that's what we wanted to do. So take that, take that for whatever GM speak, man. Hey, that's a, that's a, that's a rookie GM with a veteran quote yep. right there. Um, but yeah, like the, the biggest thing I, I keep seeing with the Titans is like, Oh, they're, they could be in contention for Caleb Williams. And I'm like, what, what Tennessee Titans team have you guys been watching? I mean, this team has been shredded by injuries for two years straight and they were still in a week 18 playing situation. Like, with a you know third string quarterback that they had just picked off the street. So I'm like for them to get a legitimate, in my opinion, first round quarterback prospect at any point, let alone in the second round with immense upside, like that's a huge win for the Titans to have some bit of a plan there. Um, I, I guess I, I didn't put this on the, the prep list, but are they just done with Malik Willis now? Did that just completely fall out? I think the, the new rule where you're allowed to keep uh, three quarterbacks. Um, it's like, have you heard about this after the yep. the 49er situation where you can keep three quarterbacks, but you can only play um, the, and it doesn't count as a 53 man roster spot, right. but you can only play the third quarterback if your top two go down. I think that is the only um, really like the only way that he makes the roster um just because you know ryan Tannehill's your guy for this year and will levis was a better prospect than malik willis even disregarding last season um and i i don't know that they're they're done with him i mean ideally ideally he develops into a good backup or a trade piece um but what he showed last year it was just really discouraging um coming in you know he was someone that like I said, he shouldn't play year one. He's a, a developmental um, kind of project. And he started, you know, look, watching him in the preseason, he started out, um, it was like, yeah, there's a, a long way to go with this guy. And then as you progress throughout the season, what I wanted to see was him develop um, the ability to to read over the middle of the field. And he just did not show that. If you watch the, the game at Houston, um, it, he got the start. They run one of their first plays. They run play action bang, which is just like a short dig route play action. Linebackers bite up. You've got the most wide open window uh, to hit Traylon Burks on the bang route. He double clutches. It's incomplete. A couple mm-hmm. plays later, they do a leak, uh, leak play action leak to Chiga Conquo. He's wide open down the sideline, double clutch, throws it out of bounds. At that yeah. point, I think Malik Willis finished the game with like four passing attempts. Cause at that point, Mike Vrabel was like, okay, we just have to win. So we're just going to run the ball every single play. Um, and like, from that point, you could just tell that there was not the coaching staff didn't have confidence in him. That's why they were, um, that's why they started Josh Dobbs to end the year. Um, so I, I never want to say that somebody can't improve. I mean, if he, he can come back, um, this training camp, a, a different person and, and just, you know, I, I think he definitely has, I, I think he would get picked up like if he was cut and I, I think they want to keep him on the roster um, as yeah. a developmental piece, but I don't think they're, they're banking on him as their quarterback of the future. Yeah. Well said. Uh, what position battles do you see uh, kind of heading into camp here and who do you think wins those? So the most interesting positional battle to me is defensive back. And it's almost, it's almost less of a battle and more of just how do they, how do they fit all the pieces together? Cause you've got Christian Fulton as, as your cornerback one, I assume Sean Murphy bunting is going to be the cornerback two on the outside. And then you put Roger McCurry at nickel. I think that's probably the, the best possible um, outcome, but then you've got, guys like Elijah Molden, who I think is good enough to warrant playing time. Um, they've, they've talked about moving, like playing him as the third safety, um, which I think that he has the skill set to play safety and slot. And, you know, third safety is essentially like a slot corner mm-hmm. um, when you're going into dime. So I, I think just like how, how guys like Trey Avery and Elijah Molden 
fit into the lineup um, is going to be really interesting with the defensive backfield. Our last topic here today is uh, our sup- superlatives challenge. And this is going to be a back and forth uh, kind of draft, if you will, for us. Um, where we're going down different kind of categories and picking players for them. So we're going to start with the team MVP and I will give you the first selection here for uh, who's the most valuable player for the Titans at the end of the year. All right, I'm going to take I'm going to say Jeffrey Simmons here. Um got the new contract this off season. He's someone that I think could uh you could say is like a breakout player even though he's already broken out in a sense. Um if you watch like the first half of the season, he got injured around halfway through the season. Um like it's two different two completely different players. The first half he was on that like Chris Jones, Dexter Lawrence, Quinn and Williams um, path where he was just dominating every snap. Um, if you look at like the PFF grades, it's actually really telling there because after he got injured, his it, it wasn't that he was a bad defensive lineman. He was just like an above average starter, um, not really a high impact player snap in and snap out. Um, and I think, you know, just see, I think he has a chance with a full season um, and like the way that he's developed his pass rushing skill set. He's always been a consistent run defender. I think if he can put together a full season, uh, you know, he'll, he'll be in that like top three, top four um, defensive lineman uh, tier. Yeah. He's a guy that's just feels like every year he's like just on the cusp of getting into that, like Chris Jones range. Um, So yeah, I would love to see that. He was at the top of my list as well. Um, so I got to go to my second option for team MVP and, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go with a surprise pick here and he would never like be voted team MVP, but I think someone that could, uh, really swing whether or not this team can be in the mix at all for the playoffs is Andre Dillard, who, uh, I did like a lot coming out. I feel like, you know, he, he has all of the the tools to be a good pass protector. And you talked about it earlier with just how bad the left tackle play was um, with, uh, Oh gosh, what's, what's his name? Dennis Daly. <laughs> Dennis Daly. Yeah. Gosh, that was, that was rough, man. Um, it reached so, a point last season where I was like, I was like, all right, I need to, I, this guy's had enough. Like I would, I would always tweet about like how bad he was. And then it got to a point where I'm like, all right, this guy's about to be like just a, a dude like me who is not in the NFL. So I need to stop talking as much. shit. Um, yeah. And I mean, it reached the point where like Tannehill was like predetermining his reads. Cause he was like, it has to be there or I'm getting sacked. Um, so I think Dillard can just kind of stabilize that blind side, get, get Tannehill to play a little bit more comfortable. Uh, I don't know how much he's going to offer in the run game, but uh, someone that I could just see being, you know, just be a top 20 left tackle, be a little bit surprising. A lot of people kind of laughed at that contract. And, uh, you know, he's a first round pick. The Eagles traded up to jump the Houston Texans to get him way back when. And then Jordan Maialata broke out. So Dillard yeah. just never really got a chance to prove what he can do. Uh, I didn't hate that signing. So he's going to be my pick for team MVP. Um, so now this is where it's tough. I could give you the first pick for unsung hero but I think you're going to steal my guy. So I could make the rules here and say this is a snake draft situation. No, you know what? I have two really good picks, and I think I know who you're going to pick, so I'll give you Unsung Hero. Okay. Who do you think I'm going to take? I'm curious. Monty Rice? No. No? Okay. No. Because I think he could be a sung hero. Okay. Um, Well, let's hear Tart. That's Tire Tart. (laughs) That was mine, yeah. I knew you were going to take him. Um, Yeah. Yeah, dude. I do. I watched three games of film for every team as I prep for the series and all three games that I picked, I was like, yeah, that's a starting nose tackle defensive yeah. tackle in the NFL. Like he's, uh, does everything you look for, uh, can two gap can stop the run. He, they put a lot of pressure on that D line. They want them to just dominate up front. So these linebackers can fly around and make plays and he allows them to do that. And that's why he's unsung. He's not always splitting through making tackles in the backfield. He's not going to grade out it well every week because you're not going to win very often when you are getting doubled, but if you can hold your ground, um, that's incredibly valuable, especially for uh, a lot of these bare fronts and stuff that Vrabel wants to run. So there's that. And he's not like the most useless pass rusher you'll ever see either. So like, I, I think he's a guy that a lot of Titans fans know how good he is, but no one really knows about tire tart. 
Yeah, I mean, like the run defense speaks for itself. It'll be interesting to see what he um, what he adds as a pass rusher because every play he's not being asked to just like fire off the snap and you know pressure the quarterback. So um, he hasn't really gotten those opportunities. I was looking; he had on like true pass sets, he had a pass rushing PFF pass rushing grade of like eighty nine. Um, so like when he was actually, you know, getting involved as a pass rusher, he was really efficient. Um, but a lot of it's just kind of like trying to overwhelm them with, with power. It doesn't really have many moves at this point. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he develops there. Mm-hmm. So you got the um, pick now. So yeah, Our my unsung, unsung hero. hero, I think I'll go Monty Rice. Um, I was, I was a big fan of him coming out of the draft and like, it didn't seem like really any Titans fans uh, liked that pick. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there were, but just the general consensus. And um, he hasn't gotten a lot of, of buzz, but when he played last year, I mean, he ranked third among linebackers in run stop rate. Um, he kind of took a step back in, in coverage, in my opinion, but he's been a good cover linebacker for most of his career. Um, if you watch like the end of the Eagles game, he puts this move on Jordan Mailata, like, very very reminiscent of david long you can tell that they they uh, train together so yeah. yeah i'm excited to see what monty rice um does this year and this this defensive line um that the titans have had really since jarell casey all the way through jeffrey simmons just creates good linebackers because they're allowed to stay clean um you've got two guys up front that are going to consistently hold their own against double teams and um you can just get like undersized guys that play fast shoot gaps and like rack yep. up tackles. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that makes me a little concerned because we, we made a rule that we can't reuse players here. That's what the challenge right. is involved here. So he was one of my breakout defensive players. I only have, I only put down two guys. So hopefully my, uh, my guy can last there, but um, that if we're doing this snake draft situation, you are back up and our next superlative is breakout offensive player. Okay, I'm going to go, this actually isn't the guy that I think is most likely to break out, but I'm going to take a more under the radar guy, and I'm going to say Kyle Phillips. Nice. Uh, wide receiver. He he was uncoverable last year when he was on the field. It was just such a, a limited sample size. Like the Giants game, I don't know. If, if there's some place that charted like, open rate like i know 538 has that his open score mm-hmm. for that game had to have been like 99 because I, I don't know if there was a single play where they covered him um but a smaller guy that that got injured last year um it is it's hard to know how much to expect from him um but like when he's on the field i think i feel fully confident in him Traylon burks and Chigaconquo as your as your top three options like the problem with the receiving core is that if one of those guys get in gets injured you're relying on players that aren't really NFL caliber. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a great pick. Loved him coming out. Um, well, that does just kind of leave trailing Burks sitting there for me. Yeah. Which we I, haven't really I, talked I about Burks. Um, he was, he was on my list for team MVP as well. I mean, I always felt like um, he could be solid year one, but year two was probably going to be a big leap for him. And uh, it is going to be interesting to see schematically like what they want to do, like we talked about earlier, because I always pictured him as that A.J. Brown role in that offense with the crossing routes and all that where he's really at his best. But, I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. The supply and demand is there for him. The uh, opportunity for him to be the number one wide receiver, I think uh, we saw the talent is clearly there. Obviously, it was a first-round pick, dominated the SEC. When he got on the field last year, when he finally got healthy and – they were able to get plays drawn up for him. He executed to the absolute best of his ability. So I I really think he's going to be one of those guys you want to target, like in your in your uh, fantasy drafts and a guy that can kind of, you know, surprise what, what he did last year, I suppose. So pretty straightforward pick there for sure. Um, yeah, if you're in a fantasy draft, like do whatever you can to get a piece of this Titans passing offense. That's what I was saying. <laughs> uh no shade thrown not at all (laughs) um uh so that puts me back up with the breakout defensive player so i do get to take the only other guy because you took monty rice i guess i'll go with uh sean murphy bunting 
Uh, we talked a little bit about him before we sat down. Uh, Got to stay healthy. That's a big thing for him. It feels like he's always playing banged up. Signs that one-year prove-it deal. Someone that I felt like if he did stay healthy in his final year for Tampa last year would have gotten a much more significant contract. Love the system he's going into. They're going to let him play bump and run and uh, play physical. And and I think it's just a really good spot for him. I don't know where he's going to line up. You know, left corner, right corner, slot corner, dime corner, whatever it is. I think he's eventually going to carve out a really nice season and earn earn that contract I talked about. Three years, 30 plus million, um, and solidify himself as a, as a good starter yet again. I will go with, um, man, I'm deciding between two guys. I think I'm going to say a money hooker. Um, okay. You could say that he's already kind of broken out since he's gotten a, a second contract, but um, he his contract was extended last off season, and then he was injured for a lot of last year, so he didn't really get that true fifth year. Um, but the last time that we've really seen him play healthy was the Bengals playoff game that the Titans lost, and that's one of the best individual safety performances that I've ever seen. Um, just made some incredible game-changing plays. I've always been a huge fan of Amani Hooker um, since he was uh, back up in his first couple years and ever since he's gotten into the lineup. Uh, what you know, what he does as far as run defense, the ability to, to be a good run defender coming from depth and allows the Titans to get away with playing that sort of defensive scheme that, you know, you're, you're not a huge fan of, I know, but like they can play with a, a light box because they have the defensive line and they have safeties that are good in run defense and, um, you know, can, can, uh, come up and fit the run. And then he's a, a great cover player. He's versatile, um, can play man coverage. So I'll go with a money hooker for my breakout. Cool. All right. So our last category here is most to prove for the season. And, uh, you get the, you get your last pick here, James. All right. I'll, I'll be nice and pick someone that I don't think you're going to pick. Um, I don't think you're going to take mine. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go Christian Fulton. Um, okay, he was on my list. Yeah. But. So I think on the field, he's been a steady, um, like high end cornerback to low end cornerback one. If you have him and McCreary as your top two, like you feel perfectly fine about that. But, um, he's kind of just been a guaranteed to miss at least five games every year. And um, with what happened last season, Mike Vrabel really reached a tipping point with the soft tissue guys. I think he's just had like Christian Fulton's in the doghouse, didn't resign David long, didn't resign Nate Davis. Um, and like some of the comments that Vrabel's made about Christian Fulton, uh, you know, like he, he wasn't at, uh, at voluntary, whatever, uh, a few months ago. So yeah, I think he, he has to stay healthy. His, his play last year was a little bit up and down, but it was kind of just, it was like a lot of fluky stuff. Like there were some coverage busts early in the season. There was this play against the Eagles where AJ Brown just trucked him and like should have been an OPI. Um, <laughs> there was a, the, uh, the Packers, like he gave up a touchdown on the Packers where it was like a late snap kind of, um, almost like they thought there wasn't going to be a play that, that sort of stuff yeah. where he got beat. So if you look at like PFF grades or something for Christian Fulton, I think that they are a little bit worse than his actual performance has been, but mm -hmm. for, yeah, for him, it's just going to be health and availability. Yeah. He, yeah that's well said. He was on my list. Um, and I kind of thought of this just on the fly here, but I'm going to go with Derek Henry for what he needs to prove is to solidify himself into the hall of fame with a potential scheme change is kind of the narrative I'm going with here. Um, you mentioned it earlier, but definitely not the same Derrick Henry when they go inside runs. Like he's still good, still good vision, still quick feet. But when I think Derrick Henry, I think of the wide zone stuff. I think he's borderline already a hall of famer, but I think if he can have another, you know, 1500 yard season at, um, is he 30 yet or is he still 29? I don't think he's 30. Let's see. Drafted in 16. Oh, he's only 28. Yeah. So, but the uh, clock is always ticking for these running backs once you get over that age point. So, um, he's he's kind of pushing right up on the clock. He met those first couple of years, he was sitting behind DeMarco Henry. So, I want to see Derrick Henry um, 
really prove that, you know, I, I'm not trying to question his vision, but put him in a different system, have another consistent year, and lock up uh, a Hall of Fame career for, for Derrick Henry, if he hasn't already done that. But um, I think it would certainly help. So Yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see what his, like, top speed looks like because there were a few times last year where he got caught from behind but then you watch the plays and it, it's it's easy to talk yourself into like oh the the corner was coming from an angle and then it's like um i just kind of in denial that derrick henry's lost the step i don't know because <laughs> he, he wasn't really able to break out break out those huge runs he was getting um caught at, at the goal line a few times last year so it'll be interesting to see yeah for sure all right james this was fun as always everybody Definitely make sure you check out uh, A to Z, uh, A to Z Film Room, the uh, YouTube. Uh, you guys got some cool, um, you know, film breakdowns going on. Just did uh, just did a video on your on your guy Quay Walker. No way! What a, I, what I a year! <laughs> All right, definitely got to check that out. All right, you knew you were coming on here, so you're like, we gotta yeah. we gotta get Quay Walker going. Love it. Um, All right, yeah. Thanks, James. Anything else you want to say before we get out of here? No, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, for watching. We'll see you for the next one.